let's see. Memes asks, has anyone ever done further investigation into the paper that I wrote long ago with my friend Jan Ambjorn on the thermodynamics of the vacuum? Yeah, well, so so that was in oh, 1981, I think. It was uh, when I was still a card-carrying particle physicist, sort of. I uh, wrote a couple of papers called Properties of the Vacuum. And um, uh, there was one called Mechanical, one called Electrodynamic. And we promised a, a part three, which was the gravitational, which was about gravitational properties of the vacuum. We never wrote part three. Um, we got many, many requests over the years for part three. And I think I finally figured out a year or two ago what part three should talk about. But at the time, back in the beginning of the 1980s, um, it was a time when when properties, the gravitational properties of the vacuum were definitely things that were sort of emerging through studies of Hawking radiation, black holes, other kinds of things like this. But um, we didn't sort of know how that worked. I think we now more do know how that works. And I keep on telling uh, Jan Ambjorn that we should, uh, uh, I keep on saying, let's spend a weekend and try and write part three. And I don't think he takes me seriously because, uh, uh, you know, he's an academic and academics don't write papers, you know, substantial papers on a weekend. It's only it's only crazy people like me who, uh, well, who've spent decades building tools and so on that uh, it becomes even conceivable to actually do significant scientific work in a, in a weekend. But in any case, the um, uh, if you ask what what became of those papers, you know, the most interesting thing that became of them, they were studying kind of what happens to a little piece of vacuum that's put in a box. And actually, a chap called Robert Forward pointed out a few years, of, quite a few years after we'd written those papers, said, you know what, the way that you've set this up, there's been a, the, um, uh, as you, as you change the shape of this box, by the way, the, the, the big effect is the thing called the Casimir effect, which is that if you have two metal plates, two big metal plates, um, and they're very close together, and it's all in the vacuum, there's a small force of attraction between those metal plates. The origin of that is that in quantum field theory, there are always vacuum fluctuations, there are always zero point fluctuations of the of the field of the for example the electromagnetic field there's always little electron positron pairs that are that are coming up and and, and disappearing in short amounts of time there is there are always these fluctuations in the electromagnetic field but it turns out between the plates you're kind of the presence of those plates is cutting out certain low frequency long wavelength uh fluctuations of the field so there are fewer fluctuations of the field between the plates than there are outside the plates and that's sort of why there's a force of attraction as even in the vacuum between those plates because sort of the vacuum isn't quite the same between the plates because you've cut out these low frequency modes by the fact that the plates are there well that argument about you know that sort of intuitive argument doesn't quite work because if you have a a metal box so to speak that's a whole three-dimensional box actually the force of the casimir effect goes to put a pressure outwards rather than a pressure inwards. People for a little while thought that maybe the Casimir effect could, could account for kind of a mechanical model of the electron, where the electron will be sort of held together by Casimir forces, even though electrostatic forces would tend to make it fall apart. But it doesn't work because the intuitive argument I gave isn't quite right when you analyze the three-dimensional modes of the electromagnetic field, which is what Jan and I did back in 1981. And um, uh, we kind of analyzed it for arbitrary shapes of boxes, and what Robert Ford then pointed out was if you take our results on these shapes of boxes, you kind of squidge them around, you will discover that there's a closed cycle, very much like Carnot's cycle, a closed cycle of, of, acti of action of, to this machine in the vacuum, so to speak. If you change the shape of this box um, in, in the vacuum, you can go through a closed cycle and extract energy from the vacuum. And so he wrote some papers. He was also a science fiction writer, and I think he put this in his science fiction books as well. But he wrote papers about kind of extracting energy from zero point energy of the vacuum. And it even became there were some studies of kind of spacecraft propulsion based on zero point energy. I think the main sort of uh, main place where that's landed is in dialogue in various science fiction movies about sort of zero point energy as a source of uh, of, uh, uh, of of sort of um, ac action of various kinds. But in any case, that was um, so. It seemed, uh, you know, at first when when uh, when this came up, it was like, did I get the calculations wrong? Well, no, I didn't. Um, but the thing that happens, so does this work? Can you extract energy from the vacuum? Can you make a perpetual motion machine basically by using this closed cycle uh, in this in this um, uh, in of these Casimir forces and so on? Well, the answer I think is no. 
because basically what happens is in that what, when you make these sort of borders and you're trying to sort of prevent vacuum you're trying to constrain the vacuum turns out you can only do that to some extent it turns out that the there it's only opaque to some modes but 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 in order to make this work you, it has to be the case that this material is sort of perfectly opaque and by the time you it, it starts to be affected by the fact that you have to make the material out of atoms and so on and you can't make something which sort of has that perfect opacity uh, you you might wonder could you make a configuration of a field just like when you do plasma confinement in a uh, to get to, to get fusion you're not trying to constrain that 10 million degree uh, plasma in a you know no no material substance can have its atoms hang together at 10 million degrees but a magnetic field doesn't care about temperature in that sense and so you can have a magnetic field that uh, that can withstand that and it makes me wonder as i'm thinking about this now whether you can imagine kind of a a field that is uh, constructed to make sort of this box that will constrain the vacuum uh, it's worth looking at actually um, worth looking at. It's it's kind of a that would be the ultimate irony if on the 200th anniversary of of Carnot's uh, uh, argument that there can where, where he used the argument that there can be no perpetual motion machine if in fact one figures out how to construct a perpetual motion machine that it continually extracts energy from the vacuum. It's it's not an impossible thing because the vacuum if one extracted energy from the vacuum if one was able to kind of what one would be doing is, is essentially exactly what Carnot was talking about namely going from the heat not really heat but the randomness of the zero point fluctuations of quantum fields and taking that randomness and turning it into into mechanical work actually it's an interesting idea to see to what extent one can make kind of uh, inequalities of the same kind that Carnot did to uh, um to 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 see you know to what extent you can extract energy from the structure of the vacuum now i mean there are things that one can do with event horizons and black holes where one can make arguments that are sort of Carnot like arguments that end up being about the thermodynamics of black holes. They don't really have thermodynamics in the same sense, but there are kind of Carnot-like arguments that could be made there. So this makes one wonder whether if one thinks about sort of this, uh, you know, changing the shape of the of the vacuum, of the box in the vacuum, to what extent a closed cycle there is able to extract energy from the vacuum. If it did extract energy from the vacuum, what that would be saying is essentially one is trading off some features of, for example, the cosmological expansion of the universe from things that are happening locally. It's sort of, we'd be, you know, in, in terms of the, is it a, um, uh, is it a renewable energy source? Well, ultimately, no. You know, if we took all the, all the energy of expansion of the universe and, uh, and, can, and, and provided it to run our cars or whatever, no, it wouldn't be, you know, we'd have to have an awful lot of cars to have a, a make any dent on the cosmological expansion of the universe. But in principle, it would, uh, it would do that. Now, one thing that's also tricky in thinking about what one's, what's going on there is that the idea of energy conservation is only a local idea. When you look at the whole structure of the universe at a cosmological level, energy conservation is a much more complicated issue, and it's much less clear what it means to say, quotes, energy is conserved. That's something that's absolutely true locally, but when you look at the energy associated with the expansion of the universe and how that has effects at cosmological scales, it's not so clear.